My name is Geoffrey Jones, and I am a minister in Second Lama Valley and my rural Presbyterian churches. Greetings in Jesus' name. The only announcement I have today is that live services are continuing in both congregations on each Sunday morning, and also that the format of these pre-recorded services will continue until into October. We're glad that you can join us, whether live or on this YouTube channel. And we pray that the Lord would bless us as we come to worship him together. Let us worship God. Our first praise is, How Great Thou Art.
Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, on this day we come to worship you. We recognize you as a God who is eternal. You have no beginning. You have always been. We praise you because there are no time limitations with you. We worship you, our Father, because you are all self-sufficient. You need no one else to survive. You are not dependent on anyone or any other outcome. But you are God. You reign supreme. And you are worthy of all glory and honour and praise. And we thank you for the privilege that we have this morning of coming into your presence to worship you. We also think, Father, of the perfection that you have in your holiness, in whom there is no shadow of turning, but you are completely holy. We thank you for the perfection of your love and goodness, of your righteousness and wisdom. We thank you, our Father, that you are God. We see also a perfection of justice and therefore we thank you and we praise your name that you are also perfect with grace and mercy. Our Father, in the light of all of your perfections, we recognize that we are a sinful people who have fallen short of the glory of God. This day, as we worship you, the great I am, we pray that we would indeed know what it is to seek your forgiveness and your mercy and grace, and with a fresh, forgiven heart, worship you as Lord and God, as our shepherd and Lord. Our Father, we pray that you'd hear our prayer just now. In Jesus' name, Amen. William Clyde is going to read God's word for us. And then Kerry McElmoyle is going to speak to the boys and girls. I'm William Clyde from Second Lamavadi. The Bible reading is taken from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 to 6. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. As a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They think it strange that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. Hi, I'm Kerry McElmoyle from Moreau Congregation. Well, good morning, boys and girls. I hope everyone's keeping well. Isn't it hard to believe you're back at school two whole weeks already? So, the summer holidays do feel like a long time ago, don't they? Well, I wanted to share with you this morning one of the places that we went. We didn't go very far in our summer holidays this year, but we did manage to get away. So, does anyone recognise where this is? Has anyone been to this place before? It's not far, believe it or not. Yes, there's a lovely blue sea and the sun's shining. Now the day we went there, it wasn't that bright. It was very dull, but the sea was lovely and calm. That's actually a place called Innistrahull, and it's the most northern point in Ireland. So Innistrahull, um, you have to go there by boat. It's a wee island. And when we arrived, we were given a couple of hours to go and explore. So the first thing we did was to go up to this lighthouse. And um, I was really amazed. It's a really lovely, uh, lovely building. And it's in fact 200 years old. So um, 
it got me thinking a lot about lighthouses and I just thought this morning I would share a wee bit about what I had learned about lighthouses. So, what is the purpose of a lighthouse? Well, a lighthouse shines, look at that lovely big bright light. Lighthouses shine that big bright light out into the sea at night in the dark to tell the sailors about danger and to also tell the sailors at night about um, the safe places. So certain lighthouses will indicate a safe place for the sailors to come into to port or to harbour and other lighthouses will tell the sailors about dangers. So lighthouses are very, very important and over the years lighthouses have saved millions of lives. So they're really incredible and you know they're built with that sole purpose of serving, serving the community and keeping the sailors safe at night. So lighthouses, um, their, their sole purpose really is to serve and when the storms come the lighthouse stands tall and strong. The lighthouse, regardless of how the waves batter and how the waves come up, the lighthouse will stand tall and strong and the light will shine regardless. The light shines every night faithfully. So, you know, when you're out at sea, the sailors can really rely upon the light from the lighthouse to keep them safe. And they, they look for that and they trust in it and they know that the lighthouse won't let them down. And you know, that got me thinking a lot, you know, because the lighthouse actually is a lot like how Jesus is for us. You know, Jesus is our, um, he's like a lighthouse because he is the light of the world. He actually came into the world to serve, just as the lighthouse is there to serve the sailors out at sea. The light, Jesus came into the world to serve, to seek and to save those who are lost, to save us from our sins. And Jesus can be trusted. Jesus can be trusted through all things, through anything that is worrying us or scaring us. Jesus can be trusted. In the Bible, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So Jesus is there to navigate and to help us on our way through life. So when there's things that are worrying us or scaring us, it's maybe if we've got a test at school or something that we, we just think we can't cope with, we can know we can trust in Jesus. And all we have to do is just pray to him and he's always there, just like that light and from the lighthouse shining in the darkness is always there for the sailors. Jesus is always there for us too. And we can talk to him at any time. And the Bible says Jesus is the way and he is the only way for us to get to heaven. He is the light of life. And just like the light from the lighthouse, Jesus is light to us. And what is light? Light gives life. You know, without light, without the sun, nothing would grow. Um, if we didn't have the light, we wouldn't be able to see. The world would be dark. Light is everything. Light is life. And Jesus is just like that. He says, I am the light of the world. So the other thing about lighthouse is actually at the top of the lighthouse, there's this amazing thing and it's called a Francel lens. And this is what it looks like. And the Francel lens makes the light that the lighthouse is shining really bright. It actually magnifies the light from the lighthouse. And do you know what? God wants us to be like that lens. God wants us to magnify and shine the light of God out of our hearts and to magnify his light to be like a lens so other people can see God's love through us and Jesus living in our hearts. That love radiates out as we um, serve him and as we live for him day by day, other people can get to know, we can tell others about Jesus and we can do kind things to help people and follow Jesus. We look to Jesus in the Bible to see how he loved others and that teaches us how we should also love others as well, the way he loves us. So boys and girls, I hope whenever you see a lighthouse that this makes you think about what Jesus has done for us and he is our lighthouse. And in the Bible it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So 
Maybe this week for your little crafts, if you fancy to even draw on a nice picture of a lighthouse and maybe some of the bigger boys and girls could even have a wee look through the Bible and try and find a nice verse that refers to Jesus as light or Jesus as the way. You know, pick your favourite Bible verse, whatever you want to do, but um, try and find a wee verse and just reflect on it as well. And, um, and if you want to send in a wee picture of a lighthouse, that would be great. So... Um, Thank you for listening. I hope you've enjoyed that. And now we're going to move on to the kids' song and it is My Lighthouse by Rent Collective. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy it. In my wrestling and in my doubts In my failures you won't walk out Your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. You are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you. Oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore. Let us come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we again thank you for the opportunity of meeting together to worship you. We thank you for those who have used gifts and talents to be able to create and sustain the opportunities that we have for worshiping online. We thank you for the opportunity of being able to meet even in our own homes whenever we were unable to worship at live services, but also, Lord, for these days, as many of us still consider 
what we're able to do and whether we're able to go back to church, whether we're comfortable enough. We pray, Father, that you'd uh, receive our thanks for the opportunities that we have in coming together in this manner. We also thank you for those who have been working hard to create uh, a safe environment in our meeting houses. We thank you, Lord, that in both congregations now we're having live services on a Sunday morning. And we thank you so much that there are those who have attended who have spoken of how safe they have felt. We pray, Father, that you would continue to enable us to have uh, safety as we meet together and that we would be very much aware of your presence and of the life-changing power of the Spirit as you apply to us your word and your truth. We pray, Almighty God, that you would be with us as sessions within our congregations as we continue to think through how we can uh, responsibly allow other aspects of our church life to uh, recommence. We pray, Father, that whether we're meeting uh, online or in person, that you'd enable us to know your presence and that we would be able to make right decisions in the coming months as we re-establish some more activity. But Father, we do pray for wisdom and discernment so that we may do the right thing at the right time. Be with those, Father, in different organisations who are also talking about how they can come back, whether that be within BB or GB or other activities. Father, we pray that you'd grant us a knowledge of your presence and help in these days. We thank you, Lord, that schools have returned and we thank you, Lord, for the uh, ways in which many have complied with the requests of the schools and how to enter and leave schools and the way in which uh, boys and girls are able to be looked after safely. We pray that you'd continue to enable uh, those who are delivering education to be kept safe. We pray that the boys and girls will be kept safe. And we pray that whether they're traveling to and from school on buses, that they too, Lord, would know uh, well-being in these days. Father, there are different days uh, ahead. There are different patterns for teaching and for supporting pupils. We pray that you'd bless teachers in their work and at whatever level they're working, whether they're the ones that have to move around different classrooms or, or whether they're simply staying with the one group of children in one bubble, we pray that you'd watch over them and keep them safe. Our Father, we thank you for the way in which you meet with us where we are. And we thank you that you have been a God to us, whether we have been meeting quietly in our own homes or whether we're venturing out into churches. Father, may we know your help, your mercy and grace. We thank you for those who in various organisations have been keeping in contact with other church members. We thank you for those who have sought to be supportive to those in need, whether they need CDs or whether they need a phone call or whether they need something practical done. We thank you for those who have shown kindness. Father, today we remember those who mourn. May you draw near those who know sadness and a broken heart today. May you be gracious to them and may they know your comfort and peace. We also pray, our Father, for those who are still worried. They're concerned whenever they see people with no masks. They're concerned whenever they see people with masks because that's a reminder that there's something out there that's dangerous. Our Father, we pray that you'd enable us all to have a proper perspective, but to do the right thing, not just for our own contentment, but for the sake of others. Help us to be a people who show the love of God, who seek to wear face coverings when appropriate, who seek to keep distance whenever it's the right thing to do, who seek to be of help whenever we have the opportunity, who are enabled to have the right words to say at times whenever we need to be a comfort. Bless us and help us in these days to know your mercy and your grace. Hear our prayers and bless us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we come now to 1 Peter chapter 4 and verses 1 to 6. 
and we come to a passage where Peter invites us to look at our own lives in terms of our motivations and priorities and the outcome of that in terms of our behaviour in the light of Jesus and all that he has achieved. There's a lot of discussion today about our responsibilities as citizens. Are we willing to wear face coverings? Are we willing to social distance? And very much the idea in so much of the uh, material that we have to read or that we're hearing on television is really about are we willing to look beyond ourselves from thinking about what suits me to what suits others as well. Uh, one of the signs you'll often see on the motorways presently is we're in this together. We're in this together. And the idea is that if the uh, people can see the fact that we're in this together, that they'll behave differently socially rather than just living for what feels comfortable for themselves. They'll start to behave in a different manner. Whenever we have different priorities, different motivations, it changes our behaviour. And the hope is that whenever we think differently, it'll change how we behave and then the uh, numbers of COVID cases will start to drop. I think it's good thoughtful advice to think about others rather than just ourselves and that's certainly one of the ways in which we have approached putting on live services and I'm pleased to say that so far the feedback from people is that, is that they have felt safe. We hope and pray that that will continue. What is clear here from uh, 1 Peter chapter 4 is that Peter's very clear that our motivations and our outlook do change our priorities and our behaviour. And here in 1 Peter 4, uh, Peter wants us to examine our lifestyles in the light of who Christ is and what he has done for us. Whenever we look at Jesus, whenever we see his suffering, whenever we see his example, Peter prays that uh, believers will come to know those realities of priorities and a change of motivation so that we ourselves will start to behave more as Christ's people, as followers of Jesus. And so with three things that we want to look at in this passage. First is, uh, just like Christ. Secondly, jettison some characteristics. And finally, judgment is coming. Just like Christ. Jettison some characteristics and finally judgment is coming. In verses 1 and 2, we see that we're just to be like Christ. Just like Christ. Our attitudes, our behaviour should be like Jesus. If we claim to be his people, if we are followers of Jesus, we're to be just like Christ. In verse 1, we read, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, just like Christ. Because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. There is the example here that we're to follow. Now, uh, chapter 4, verse 1 is actually linked to chapter 3, verse 18. In chapter 3, uh, verse 18, we read, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He, is put to, he was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Therefore, chapter 4, verse 1, since Christ suffered in his body, we're to have the same attitude because he suffered in his body and is done with sin. Here, the Christian is somebody who identifies with Christ, identifies with his sufferings, and Jesus came into this world and suffered for the purpose of breaking with sin of enabling people who follow him to be able to break from sin and its dominion over them. Christ suffered in his body and because he suffered in his body, because of all of the sacrifice that he uh, completed, at different times through these chapters we have seen, therefore, were to behave in such a manner, have the same attitude, follow the same example and so on. There is an outcome. And here we're told that because Christ has suffered in the body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. This verb to arm yourself is really a military word. It's about getting ready. It's about putting on the weapons and putting on the armor and getting ready for action. 
And we ourselves are to go into spiritual conflict with the same attitude as Christ. We have that lovely hymn, don't we? May the mind of Christ my Saviour live in me from day to day. We are to be people who have the same attitude, the same mind as Jesus. We're to have the same way of thinking, if you like. He is saying, beloved fellow Christian, grow up. Get the mind of Christ. Become a person of resolve. Be prepared. Be united with Christ by faith. You will need to be able to identify with him in his suffering. As we identify with Christ in his suffering, we too may be called to suffer. We too may be called to face persecution and opposition. But we are to be a people who follow him and who are therefore done with sin. Christ died on the cross to defeat sin and have his dominion broken. Therefore, we're to have the same attitude, being willing to go and be broken with sin, to have done with sin. Different um, parts of scriptures, different uh, translations refer to being done with sin or being broken with sin or cease from sin. And uh, these words refer really to being identified with Christ, united with him in his suffering, being resolved, therefore, to follow in the kingdom of light and the dominion of Jesus rather than being under the rule of sin. Jesus himself has broken with sin. He has done with sin. That's a very important way for it to be put to us because it means it's been something that has been done for us in the past. What are we to be? We're to be someone who has done with sin. So it's something that's done in the past and it's something that's done for us. It's the work of God. How can we be uh, taken out of the dominion of sin where it rules and uh, is powerful over us? Well, we find that it is the work of God. And therefore, having seen what Christ has done for us, as suffering on the cross, as he defeats sin, then live as his follower. Go his way. Have the mind of Christ, arm yourself with the same attitude and be released from sin by the power of God. Doesn't mean we're perfect yet, but now we can fight sin. Now we can go against it rather than just going with the flow. And the result of that comes in verse 2 where we see he does not live the rest of his earthly life for human desires, but rather for the will of God. No longer for human uh, passions but for the will of God. That's the difference that there is. No longer are you eaten up by your own uh, physical desires, but now you want to do the will of God and glorify him. The behavior that the Christian leaves behind, we'll look at in a moment, but here it's very clear that we are to be a people who follow the will of God and repeatedly we're told to leave aside the old way of living and now follow Christ. Uh, for example, in 1 Peter 1, verse uh, 14 uh, to 15, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. So the mark of who we are is that we're doing the will of God not just simply being fed by our own human passions. They are taken under control as we give ourselves to God and as we are under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. So God wants us to make a commitment to holiness, to sanctification, to putting on the new ways. And again, we read of that in 1 Peter chapter 2. Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. Keep your conduct among the Gentiles honourable, so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. That's good. You're a believer. You profess Jesus as Lord. You believe in him. Now show it. Let this one saviour whom God has sent come and dwell in you to such an extent that you follow him completely. 
Your conduct is to be honourable, we're to do good deeds, we're to be just like Jesus. It's not just that we believe he exists, but that we put our trust in him. We give ourselves to him completely and we're just like Christ in our attitudes, motivations, and then by the grace of God in our behaviour. Just like Christ. The second thing we see is that we're to jettison characteristics of the life of sin. We're to jettison characteristics of the life of sin. And you see that in verses 3 to 4. We've already heard uh, in chapter 1 verse 18 uh, that we're to be set free from the empty way of life handed down to us from our forefathers. There's to be a different or certain things we're to give up. And we're to jettison characteristics of the old way of life where we lived by sinful desires. Uh, and he says, for you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, or orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. And this covers actions and attitudes. The apostle uh, here reminds us of what we have left behind the appetites that went unrestrained. And he talks about that in terms of living in debauchery. This is about lawlessness. It's about unbridled lust, about unrestraint in terms of our appetites running ahead and us following them. This is not the way to live. It's a general outline then that we have of uh, people living for their own appetites. We're told to give up lust. Uh, that's something that's uh, exceptionally important, but it's largely about our own thoughts and ideas. And um, Peter has already spoken of lusts and evil desires leading us astray. And here the word for sexual sin is also the word that Jesus uses in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 28. I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So it's not just about the actions we have, but as followers of Christ, it's also about our thought life and what we're doing with our minds and what we're setting our minds on. So it's not just about having a nice outward facade, but it's about who we are within that God knows. And we're to give up on drunkenness and orgies and carousing, that kind of unrestraint in terms of alcohol, the unrestraint in terms of uh, sexual activity, the unrestraint in terms of life just led astray carousing as it follows its own appetites all over the show and then we're also to give up on a detestable idolatry that's where we have someone maybe even ourselves as boss of our own lives rather than christ this is detestable to god detestable idolatry where we have other gods in our minds rather than him now, one of the things about this is that whenever you start to live in a way that is holy, whenever you start to have the right priorities and the right motivations that starts to change your behavior and you let certain characteristics go and you hold on to other ones, then you start to find that the world will find that very strange. And in fact, as you live for God, and uh, lots of people will want to say, oh, Jesus is my example. The fact is that whenever you don't go their way and following your own appetites and you start to live for God, they'll start to react against that. And that's what we have here in verse four. There's a price to be paid as you let go of attitudes and appetites that are unrestrained. They will think it's strange. Isn't that amazing? In the first century, as in the 21st century, Christians are seen as strange whenever they don't follow their own appetites. Rather, they say, all that I have, my motivations, my priorities, need to be in step with God, not my own feelings, desires, appetites. They think it's strange. Uh, it's an amazing thing. You see, if you're a salt and light, you're going to stand out. You're going to be distinctive. And the problem too often for believers is that we're not distinctive. The appetites and desires that others have, we allow to run loose ourselves. We need to think, what is the will of God here? 
they may think it's strange that you do not plunge with them. Think of that wording, you do not plunge with them. This isn't about dipping your toe in the water. The thing is, there's no such thing. Whenever you're gonna follow your appetites and desires, there's no such thing as dipping your toe in the water. You plunge in. And here we have this idea of plunging. It's about the idea of really losing yourself. Out of control. Out of your depth. Very quickly. You can plunge very easily into a flood of dissipation. That's really another word for self-indulgence. You go in and all of a sudden you're out of your depth and your appetites and desires overflow and it springs up and it eats you up and you become so full of self-indulgence you cannot follow Christ. Sometimes there are those who have wanted to follow Christ but have found the cost too much especially whenever people see that you're not following them and the very fact that you're not following in their lifestyles, they will think you're condemning them and therefore they will heap abuse on you. Is not so relevant today because you don't go with a certain lifestyle, because you don't go with a certain habit, because you don't have the same priorities as others, all of a sudden they'll heap abuse on you because you're living differently and therefore they will feel that they're out of step with God and the way in which they react is to heap abuse on you. They'll speak maliciously towards you, we've seen that. People will enjoy uh, having friendship with Christians, but whenever you're not going down the same road, that starts to mean you get people's backs up. And it's no different from the first century to the 21st century. There is hostility towards the Christian because whenever we don't go out and get blocked with everybody else, whenever we don't go and uh, lose our minds with alcohol and different bits and pieces along those lines, then it simply means that people don't think you're social. They have a wrong view of what's important. Whenever you don't share their pornographic movies or magazines, do you hear that, men? Whenever you don't share their pornographic movies or magazines, people will think you're strange. You don't show the same appetites and desires in the same way. That's an issue. But friends, one of the things we have to be aware of is whenever people are plunging into self-indulgence, whenever they're losing themselves in their own desires, they're the ones to be pitied because one day we read that they will have to stand before the maker of heaven and earth and face him as their judge. How do we face the future? How do we know God's help? It's whenever we walk and step with him with the right priorities and motivations, right behavior, we're just like Christ. And to be just like Christ, we have to jettison some characteristics of the life of sin and leave behind those things that eat us up and lead us away from serving God. We're to be just like Christ, we're to jettison some characteristics. And then finally, we're to remember judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. And there's two aspects that this judgment has shown to us uh, as we look at this passage. There is a comfort for the people of God in verse 6. But there's also a warning for those who have been careless with their souls in verse 5. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. They will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. My friend, you may be somebody who judges Christians for their way in which they live. One day you yourself will be judged. And you'll be judged honestly. And you'll be judged correctly. There will be no misjudged. There will be no mitigating circumstances that can be brought. Your life without God, without Christ, given over to devotions, to uh, your own plunging into self-indulgence, will be seen. They will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living 
and the dead. This is an idea of bookkeeping. You'll have to give an account. There's a record kept. Uh, Jesus himself said this in Matthew chapter 12. Men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. They'll have to give an account. We cannot hide from the judge of all the earth. He's ready to judge the living and the dead. Who is the judge? Well, we often read of it as God the Father being the judge, but we also see that uh, Christ is designated as judge. And so we can either meet Jesus today as Savior or as our judge. How do you want to meet Jesus? And he'll judge the living and the dead. So there's no escaping this judge, whether we're alive or dead. Whenever Christ comes back and the final rule is called, we will give an account of who we are and how we've behaved. And then verse 6, For this reason the gospel is preached even to those who are now dead, so that they may be judged according to men in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. What, what's this all about? Christians were worried about the uh, other believing brothers and sisters had already passed away before Christ had come back. What happens to them? Well, it may be the case that there were those who heaped abuse on them for being Christians while they were alive. It may be that there were people who persecuted Christians while they were alive. It may be that they had to face false judgments, as Peter has said, treated dreadfully, dreadfully treated dishonestly, as we have said, but whatever men are able to judge you in the body, God judges his people in the spirit and they live according to God in regard to the spirit. The gospel was preached. These Christians heard the good news, even though they're now dead. They heard the good news. They have since passed away. But even though people judge them in the body, the good news is, that whenever you die in Jesus, you will live according to God in regard to the Spirit. It's an amazing thing to see the difference that there is here. Believers might be judged, we read, judged by men. That's a one-time act that's now finished. But whenever we read that they will live according to God in the Spirit, that's open-ended, that's eternal. What a difference between those who have to give an account for how they lived with their own uh, gratification in mind to those who have lived for Jesus, heard the gospel, responded to it, believed in Jesus Christ, and after death they will live according to God in the Spirit. Peter speaks these words to his readers as a way of encouraging them to live a life that God sees, to have the right priorities, the right motivations, the right behaviours, even though they're judged by others, even though others may have abuse on them, they're to be like Christ who is broken with sin and live in Christ's way. Friend, you and I will face many obstacles in our Christian life, but we're called to be like Christ, just like Christ. We're to do the will of God and follow him and follow the will of God in the 21st century, not the way of the world. And then not only are we to follow the will of God, but we're to jettison certain characteristics that are controlled by our own appetites run wild. We're to remember that one day each one of us will appear before the judgment seat of God those who haven't trusted in Christ will have to give an account for how they have lived or will be held accountable for that. But those who have trusted in Jesus, who have heard the gospel and responded to it, will live as God Almighty sees in them the righteousness that has been given to them by Christ. This little passage, these six verses, are really about two worldviews. How do you see the world in terms of your own desires and the way the world tells you? Or do you see it in terms of God? Do you have a, a good shepherd who you follow? Have you a commitment of faith to Jesus Christ as Lord? We are to follow a holy saviour. We're to have those traits 
of having met with Jesus evident in how we live and move. Our worldview is to be eternal. We're not simply living for the quick fix, for the quick uh, little bit of satisfaction now as one of our appetites is uh, temporarily satisfied. No, we're to think of eternity. We're to think of Jesus. We're to put our trust in him. And remember that at some stage in the future, where the living are dead, we'll appear before the judge of all the earth. My friend, whenever you appear before the judge of all the earth, you'll have to give an account for your life. What will your account be? Will it be that you have lived for yourself and satisfied your own selfish desires, that you have plunged into self-indulgence and lost yourself in your own ways and thinking? Or will you stand in Christ before the throne of God, a forgiven sinner, someone who has claimed Jesus as their Lord and as their Saviour and put their trust in him, and your testimony will be that Jesus is my Lord. We're not perfect yet, are we? But whatever our background and whatever our sin, we find in Jesus a mercy that can cope with everything. We find forgiveness and grace in Jesus. And so we sing our final hymn and we pray that that would be something that you will sing in reality as well. His mercy is more. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, we pray that we would know what it is today to experience the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forevermore. Amen.
God bless you.